Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started in a few moments here, just waiting for a few more people to come into the room. All right, I think that we can get started since I see that we have a steady number and most likely we will have a few other um, connecting. Um, Alexis, I would love to introduce you as our program manager for Startup FIU Local. And I would like to welcome everyone who has connected this afternoon uh, to actually experience our workshop on optimizing e-commerce, marketing to elevate your product or service online. Um, today, this workshop is hosted to you by Miami-Dade Business Navigator. And what is it that is the Miami-Dade Business Navigator? Next. The Miami Business Navigator is actually a pilot program that was established by the American Rescue Plan Act uh, of 2021. And it uses a community navigator approach to help small businesses with economic recovery. The program is comprised of a lead hub. In this case, our lead hub is the uh, Small Business Development Center at FIU and a network of spokes of organizations that deploy community advocates to work with small businesses on recovery and resilience. In this case, today you're hosted by Startup FIU Procurement, one of the spokes for this matter. 100 million to 51 grantees uh, were granted and we are the navigator for Miami-Dade. What is the name, uh, what is the Miami-Dade Business Navigator Program? It comprehends, as I mentioned, uh, seven spokes, which are Ascendas, Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce, Branches, Prospera, the EDC, Startup FIU Procurement, and our hub, the uh, SBDC at FIU. So we are a coalition of partners that secure $2.5 million uh, from the SBA in order to provide services as a community or local navigator, assisting socially and economically disadvantaged businesses with consulting, mentoring, and training. The navigator partners are specifically targeting minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses, and LGBTQ-owned businesses. How is it that you can be in contact with one of the spokes, our hub, or any of the presenters today? You can go to miamibusinessnavigator.com or reach out to 305-779-9232 or contact us via social media at Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, via email, or connect to our YouTube channel. Just as uh, we do some upkeeping of the house, today's presentation will be uploaded in our YouTube channel, and the link uh, will be shared with all of you. In addition, you will be able to see a copy of this presentation. That being said, I would like to officially welcome Ms. Alexis Fox. She's program manager for Startup FIU Local, has a vast experience on the e-commerce, e-marketing arena, and she will be our presenter for today. If you have any questions, comments, you can use the Q&A uh, feature in the Zoom to place your questions. If you have any other comments, you can use the chat box. We'll be dropping a lot of information on the 
chat box for all of you. That being said, thanks for connecting. Alexis, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Barbara. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Alexis Fox. I'm the programming manager here at Startup FIU Local. And today we are going to be talking about the e-commerce space and how you can elevate your product or service in the space and what different tools are available to you if you are at the beginning stage of determining whether you have a viable e-commerce product or whether you've already started your e-commerce journey and just need some more information and innovative tools to help you be competitive in your market. So what we'll be discussing today is an understanding of digital marketing and the role that it plays in e-commerce, We'll talk about what the e-commerce marketing funnel looks like and entails, and then how to measure the success of your e-commerce marketing funnel. And then we'll take some questions and answers as we go. So first we need to understand the relationship between digital marketing and e-commerce. Other than the fact that both exist in the digital marketing space, it's important for us to move forward with a clear definition of e-commerce. We talk about the traditional types of e-commerce business models, the advantages and disadvantages of the e-commerce market today, and some delivery methods that will keep you competitive in the e-commerce market. So Tech Target's definition of e-commerce is the buying and selling of goods and services or the transmitting of funds or data over an electronic network, primarily the internet. The models that this includes business to business, business to consumer, consumer to consumer, and consumer to business. The B2B model transaction has a higher order value and more recurring purchases. This is important to note when we're talking about the delivery methods and the buyer journey that we'll be discussing throughout this session, because that is where small businesses have the greater opportunity as well. We are essentially looking for in the e-commerce space, opportunities to replace things that may have been ordered through catalog or order sheet with the e-commerce space. And it also creates a more niche market environment. Business to consumer is where innovators have leveraged technology such as mobile apps and native advertising. We talked about that in our previous session to market directly to their and make their lives easier in the process. So this is a consumer-based model that focuses on ease and convenience. Consumer to consumer connects consumers for an exchanging of goods and services. And typically they make their money from a transaction listing or booking fee. So influencer marketing is a really popular C to C business model. Influencer spaces are consumers. Most of the time they're reviewing a product that they've consumed to refer to the general public or their audience. And then consumer to business allows for customers to post the work that they want to be completed and have businesses bid for the opportunity. So what I like to call this model is the corporate to small business model. This is the opportunity for you as a small business to leverage partnership organizations that do yearly orders, that do large contracts, and that is a space that you also have ample opportunity due to e-commerce marketing. So let's discuss some of the advantages and disadvantages of the e-commerce space. The main advantages is convenience and increased selection. As we know, we are in a time of instant gratification now. Everybody wants everything as soon as possible at the touch of a button, at the click of a mouse, and they want it in the way that they want it. They don't wanna be limited by store operation hours, by stock, by inventory, or even by destination traveling. How far do I have to go to get the product that I actually want or desire? So there's an increase of selection now through the e-commerce atmosphere and also an increased level of convenience that people have grown to become accustomed to and almost expect. The disadvantages are the limited customer service. In this automated system, in this digital world, we lose a lot of that human connection and a lot of those personal touch points. There's also a lack of instant gratification. So yes, there's convenience as you can complete your purchase in a timely manner and as soon as you desire, but you don't actually experience the gratification until the product comes to your door. 
which leads to the next disadvantage, that products can't be seen or held until delivered. One of the things I always like to point out when I'm talking about uh, the e-commerce space and ways to separate yourself in what seems to be such a saturated market is the fact that there's a very clear line and correlation between all of the disadvantages. Limited customer service means you don't have a touch point with people. Lack of instant gratification. You can purchase it, but you don't feel the gratification until the product comes to your door, which is all based on the delivery time and the way the product is delivered to you. So all of the disadvantages in e-commerce are directly connected to delivery. So I find it very important when we're talking about being competitive and innovative in the e-commerce space and in marketing our e-commerce business that we look into those delivery methods that can set us apart from our competitors. So let's talk about some of the more innovative e-commerce delivery methods. These three I find are the best fits for small businesses with limited resource or manpower, direct to consumer, drop shipping, and subscription service based delivery options can really help elevate your e-commerce business depending on your product and service. And we'll explore all of the different avenues for each of these. So direct to consumer, the business sells its own product directly to their end user without the help of a third party wholesaler or retailer, which is what the drop shipping option would be. Advantages of a direct to consumer are owning your data. You have full autonomy over the information that you collect and it belongs to you, which gives you more control over your customer experience. You know exactly what your customer is buying, when they're buying, what avenues they're using to reach your product, and you can tailor your marketing and your revenues and your inventory around that experience. It also helps you create better relationships with your customer, which speaks directly to one of the pain points of the lack of customer service. Some challenges of direct-to-consumer is if you are a smaller staff organization, you are now responsible for managing your operation top to bottom. The packaging, maintaining the storefront, the digital sales channel, the marketing funnel as well, and then the order process as well. So if you're a smaller organization, these are the challenges that you need to consider how you will handle if you choose to do direct-to-consumer marketing. So let's take a moment to think about some of the ways that your business or your product or service could benefit or maybe find challenges in the direct to consumer marketing space. I have an example here called Lark. They are a reusable, rechargeable, sustainable water bottle that's pictured here on their website. Their whole model is based around green, green packaging, green product resourcefulness recycling. With that in mind, what are some of the ways that they would have to tackle the, the challenges of direct to consumer e-commerce? What are some of the things that they had to address before adapting this model based on the disadvantages and the advantages that we talked about? You can leave some of your thoughts about this in the chat and also think about the way your product or service can be applied to a direct-to-consumer or some changes that may need to happen to ready your business for direct-to-consumer delivery methods if that's what you're interested in. So the other option is drop shipping, which brings back in the wholesaler or retailer, whereas the direct-to-consumer market, marketing cuts it out completely. So you're marketing and selling, but you're fulfilled by a third party supplier. Drop shippers act as a middleman and can connect buyers directly to manufacturers. The benefits of drop shipping are if you don't have a brick and mortar or you don't have a storage space for your inventory, you're not confined to holding onto product that may not be moving. So how does drop shipping work? customer purchases an item from you, the seller. The seller sends the order to the third-party supplier. The supplier ships the order to the customers. The seller pays the drop shipper, and the customer receives their order. 
dropshipping has become increasingly popular through wholesalers like Amazon, Shopify, and Alibaba. So many businesses are looking to retool and incorporate dropshipping into their current platform or industry. So how would you go about doing that? The first thing you need to do is research what products would fit well with your strategy, market, and customer base. If you're a small business, your strategy and market and customer base should already be established. You should already have an idea of who you're talking to. And now the work is to feel, is to field which products or services you provide can be tailored to the dropshipping method. You need to research how your competitors are selling their product using a third party. If they are, what kind of pricing are they getting? Are you able to stay competitive with your dropship supplier costs now included as an additional expense to your business? You need to also find the best supplier and finalize the fulfillment process that works both for you and to incorporate into your existing system. The mistake that people make in small business when they go after drop shipping is that they're trying to fit a square into a circle a lot of times. Your business model is not set up to handle drop shipping. It's not set up to handle an additional party or liaison or additional fees, then drop shipping may not be the best for your business. It's really important to understand where you are financially and also to understand that the quality of supplier is going to directly dictate your customer experience, which we have already talked about is a clear advantage in e-commerce, but also can be a disadvantage when we talk about not having the human connection for customer support or not being able to have the full autonomy that direct to consumer has over the delivery time and the quality in which your package is delivered or product is delivered. And then the last thing you would need to do is list and promote your new product using the marketing tools that are at your disposal based on your strategy. So one of the main challenges to consider when you're looking into drop shipping is really the product. Does your product work for drop shipping? Products that are typically more difficult or, or higher in expenses and costs associated are heavy products because it costs, everything is by weight, it costs more to ship. Fragile products, because again, you cannot guarantee the, deliver, the quality in which your product is gonna be delivered when you're dealing with a third party. Anything of value that would need to be insured or could be intriguing for people to, to steal. And then special conditions. So things that have expiration dates that can't be handled or need to be handled in specific conditions in order to maintain the integrity of your product, you probably want to shy away from a drop shipping method for those. Also because drop shipping works with wholesalers. So it needs to be something that can be produced, packaged and shipped in bulk with little cost inferred. So let's think about this. KiwiCo is a company that does educational wholesaling. I remember growing up that there was a, a litany of educational stores that sold supplies that and schools would need year round in a brick and mortar. These supplies are super practical. They don't have any of the expiration life as it's paper or still or shelf products. And they're not necessarily heavy, it's stationary, it's usually lightweight. And there are things that we know that people will innately need, but how are we reaching those people? If you are a business that does stationary, this would be a great idea for something to be, instead of having to hold on to inventory or having to store your product somewhere. If you can come and partner with the wholesaler and tailor the type of stationery to a specific market, whether it be corporate or like KiwiCo, which does educational things for primary education, we're talking pre-K through elementary school products, then there's a way for you to tailor that demand and be able to dictate it ahead of time, especially in the education field. Schools work on calendars. The school board calendar is, is very predictable and they plan their budgets a year in advance. So once you understand the value and you can get creative about the ways that you're going after your consumer base, 
it makes you more competitive in the e-commerce space. As you can see from the photo, these are standard items, pipe cleaners, markers, books, composition books. There's nothing really unique about them other than the fact that it's anticipating the need of the consumer. Think about products that you have if you do multi-package products. Think about which products could be tailored in the same way. Think about some of the challenges that you would have to face when you are trying to go through a drop shipping process or even convert from storing inventory to drop shipping. These are things that you can consider as you try to figure out which delivery method works best for your product or service. And I'd love to hear some feedback on this as well in the comments. The last delivery method is a subscription service, which collects a recurring payment from customers for, in exchange for a recurring product, replenishment, or ongoing service. So subscription services really do impact mainly the consumer focus model, where your customer is literally at the focus of what kind of business you do. And even though we have the HelloFresh, which is a food delivery service here, you'll be surprised as we go through this, that there are many different models of subscription service that don't necessarily need to be tailored to a food or beverage product. One thing to note about subscription service is that it is completely customer and audience driven. It's important to understand your and their buying habits and their buyer's journey, which we will get into shortly, to make sure that you are able to feed their needs when you're talking about possibly pursuing a subscription service. So here are some numbers uh, recently from McKinsey and Company about the type of subscriptions and the frequency of subscriptions among men and women. So women account for the majority of subscriptions, but men are more likely to have three or more active subscriptions. This kind of information is helpful when you're trying to figure out the frequency of your subscription and who your true target audience is. So based on the study, there is five subscription types that are at the top of e-commerce business right now. Food and beverage is number one. Beauty and wellness products is number two. Paraphernalia such as sports, fan wear, and collectibles is number three. And then special occasion gift boxes, flowers, edible arrangements is number four. And number five is business to business subscriptions. Business to business subscriptions is what we're going to highlight because as small businesses, again, you need to be able to make the connection with other corporations in order to fulfill larger needs for the B2B model. Those are your recurring contracts. Those are your larger orders. And that may be best for your business. One really great example of this is Berlin Packaging. They are a packaging company based out of Australia. Their model is to provide storage and lids for all different types of products across their website. So whether it be you need soap dispensers, hot sauce bottles, or maybe even jugs for cleaning products, they are tailoring that market to a subscription-based thing. So if you're making homemade hot sauces or you know a company that is, instead of going and trying to get bottling on your own, you can subscribe to the frequency that you need the bottling order, which may be a shorter turnaround because it's a fresh product versus someone who does janitorial cleaning that needs larger storage and doesn't really have an expiration date or can be shelved in many different areas. So if you offer cleaning products or you offer a cleaning service and it's been difficult for you to get a janitorial contract, it may be best for you to go to another janitorial company and offer from the supply end. They will still need the bottling. They will still need the packaging. They'll need the paper towels in order to do the job that they've been booked to do. It's all about being innovative in the space and finding other ways to reach your goal by assessing the demand of your, in, of your industry and also understanding the need and being malleable to it. So think about some of the ways that you could retool products or services to fit the same market, but in a different way. Would a subscription service be helpful to your bottom line? 
is there co customers that you already engaged with that order on a recurring basis? And could you see the value in putting them on a subscription base instead of waiting for the order? It's all about anticipation, understanding the demand and moving forward in a creative way. So what are some ways that you can understand your target audience? The three C's are important to understanding your audience when we're talking about subscription-based e-commerce. Is your price competitive? When will your consumer use your product and service and how often, so the frequency of your subscription? And then the customer's experience on your site. What do they expect from your product or service? Was that expectation met? we're talking about acquiring and keeping customers, the same three C's apply, cost, convenience, and customer experience. The cost is on your end. Is your subscription site cost efficient? Is it more money to maintain your subscription site versus your traditional e-commerce website or platform? The convenience of it, is your site easy to navigate? If you look back at Berlin, everything was clearly labeled and based on the sizing of the jugs. They had telltale images that were clear and concise that if you were a food and beverage, this would be the kind of packaging that would be desirable for you. They had the larger jugs, which are more indicative to maybe like a cleaning project or something that's batched in a larger quantity. How easy is it for people to get to what they need on your site? And then lastly, the experience. Does your specific subscription website or channel allow for customization? If we go back to that first side about the advantages of this space is that there's no real limit to the type diversity of the selection of product that people have. People like to feel like they can find exactly what they want to their preference and liking. Is your product something that can be tailored to that? Is it something that can evolve along with your customer base? So within in e-commerce, there are three different types. There's those who subscribe for replenishment, which we talked a bit about with the school supplies and cleaning supplies. That's 32% of consumers are subscribing because they know they're going to need this product on a, on a frequency or occasion. And so they continue on with it. The second is for curation, which is 55% of consumers subscribe for curation. And the third is for access. 13% of consumers subscribe for access. They subscribe because it's quicker for them to do this than to go to a brick and mortar. So when we talk about the three different types, they will fall under the three different factors of cost, convenience, and customer experience respectively. Cost is going to impact whether your subscription-based business is for replenishment, whether it's to curate an experience, or whether it's because of access. Cost is always going to be a factor. If the audience is looking for convenience, then replenishment and access subscription types are the more popular. If they're looking for customer experience, then curation, which is all based on the experience that you curate for them and the access to the product is where they will more lean. So understanding where your audience falls in these buckets will help you to make better decisions about your subscription strategy. So as we've talked about the importance of your audience and really tailoring to your consumer, the main thread between the dropship method the direct-to-consumer method and the subscription method is understanding your e-commerce funnel. When you are trying to acquire an audience for e-commerce, your marketing funnel is super important. And what it is, is really just your buyer's journey. It's that anticipation and understanding of what your buyer will experience when they interface with your product, brand, or service. And we will talk about that journey in detail, discuss the barriers of each phase as we strive for a purchase, and we'll talk about how to optimize each part of the marketing funnel. So the journey traditionally uh, in graphs is three-tiered, like an upside-down pyramid. And 
I like to add the fourth tier of purchase and separate purchase and retention because they deserve their own nuance. Those two tiers are really important when you're talking about creating a recurring customer and customer loyalty. But the buyer's journey begins with awareness of your brand, consideration of the product or service, purchasing of the product or service, and then coming back as a retention, as a retained customer or as a loyal purchaser. So with awareness, you need to make a first impression quickly. You need to be able to educate the buyer about your business and favorably position your brand. As you know, the attention span is very, very short as we're consuming a lot of different media and a lot of different platforms at once. The average attention span of an adult is between 15 and 17 seconds active attention, whereas it used to be between 30 and 90 seconds. So you really have to come in knowing that you're serving your market and making it very clear upfront why you stand out from the competition. So how do you do that? One easy tactic, if you don't have a marketing budget or if you have limited resources for marketing is to use social media. Sites like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram offer two main marketing tools. You can do paid ads, which we discussed in the previous session, or you can do paid pages, or you can simply create a business profile. Many small businesses that start off in the e-commerce space don't start off with a traditional website or web store. They start on social media. And that's where their audience is curated. That's where they interface the most with them. That's where they promote their products. So it's a tool that you're already using in one way or another. And all you need to do is elevate that tool and understand what's available to you in order to create the proper amount of awareness for your product online. You can use these avenues not only for brand awareness, but to also get a read on your customer base and audience as most social media provides you with really good insights and analytics if you're using the professional tools that are offered and it's free. So now you have the attention of a potential consumer. Now they are considering your product. They're thinking about what it is that you're offering and whether it will work for them and if they want to buy it. This is where the uptick in interest is important. And this is where it's important to showcase your product or service in a compelling way. So what does compelling content look like? The main thing is customer tutorials. If you are producing a product or service that's used by multiple people, customer testimonials are your biggest tool for promotion and having compelling content. It's genuine, it's not tailored, it's very organic and is unique from customer to customer. You can also curate product descriptions. So on the Berlin packaging site, if they have everything labeled out from, if your product has a shelf life of two to three weeks, this is the kind of bottling we suggest. You can tailor your product descriptions to make sure that you're hitting all the marks. What problem does your product or service solve? Why does it solve it? And how are you different from your competitor? When you're creating product descriptions or captions for your social media, those are the three points you want to make sure that you hit when pushing in e-commerce or trying to sell to a consumer. And then last is what we've already discussed about creating and optimizing your product pages. If you took the time to make a Facebook business account or an Instagram business profile, utilize those tools that are available to you as a business profile versus a personal one to ensure that you are getting good analytics, that you're putting out quality content, and that your customer base is engaging with the content that you're putting out. So lastly, they are contemplating and they think that they're ready to purchase, subscribe, purchase your product, and they make you want to make that decision as easy for them as possible. The ease of the site is key in subscription, but also in any platform 
which we discussed in the digital marketing session as well. It needs to be quick to navigate. People need to be able to find the information quickly. It needs to be clear. It needs to be concise. And it needs to be easy to access. So purchasing, there has to be some sort of monetary transaction. I believe in frictionless checkout. Please use the button to raise your hand if you have ever incurred crazy fees at the end of a transaction. So you're ready to purchase, your mind is made up about this price, you're putting in your information and then you see a shipping fee, a handling fee, a transaction fee. Those kind of things are a turnoff when they're not specifically stated upfront. Do not save those fees to the end of the buying process. You will lose your customer. 50% of buyers abandon their shopping carts because of unexpected shipping fees specifically and other unplanned expenses. And this is from a survey done in 2019 by Baymart Institute. Let's also consider how long it takes to complete your purchase transaction when we talk about frictionless checkout and making the purchase easy for your consumer. How many of us use the chip or a tap the card or Apple or Google Pay or have automated payments set up? There's an ease to that system that is valuable in the e-commerce space when we're talking about people wanting convenience as a main advantage. 21% of buyers will back out of a purchase if they find the checkout process is too long and complex. So think about some of the ways that you can make your process streamlined, the ways that you can provide ease to your customer. If you're a larger uh, business or you do more procurement, there's more procurement involved in getting a purchase through, think about the ways that you can streamline that process and make it easier for your consumer because they appreciate it. And sometimes those are the small things that operate a one-time purchase current customer. Which brings us to retention. Repeat customers are an invaluable part of the e-commerce success, especially in the subscription space. It's easier to retain a customer than it is to attract a new one and it's more cost efficient. It's vital in the final part of this marketing pipeline to keep your customer base coming back time and time again. Not only coming back time and time again, but having an exceptional experience, an experience that they wanna share with others, which ties back to that compelling content, which is a large part of the consideration phase of the buyer journey. So what is a good tactic for retention? Using the email marketing, if you have it, to make sure you're engaging with your existing customers for upsells, cross-sells, and add-ons. So in the last session, we talked about the importance of email marketing and that email marketing is far from dead. It is still one of the most powerful tools in the B2B business model that you can use. You already have this curated list of subscribers. They've consented to receiving updates and information from you. You just need to make sure that that information is valuable to them. It also gives you history on the kind of purchases they've made, what products or services are selling more than others. And it'll also give you an idea of recommendations and you can ask for feedback and referrals as well. It streamlines communication to offset the disadvantage of the lack of customer service. The last thing I want you to think about when you're talking about the buyer journey, it's not called the buyer's journey, just metaphorically. It is a journey. It is not something that's going to be instantaneous as you take on the e-commerce space. It's something that's going to take time. It's something that you're going to need to retool. You're going to have to measure. And there may be things that you have to redo or try again. And so Indira Michelle is a CMP. She also is one of our instructors for the Bank of America, a small business boot camp that we're running at Startup FIU Local. She is a Facebook and YouTube ads manager and a senior copywriter and digital marketing strategist. And she says this when talking about the buyer journey from the business perspective. They, the businesses, try to move people from stranger all the way to promoter in one campaign. This is impossible. 
a campaign's goal should be to move someone from one to three journeys at a time max. So think about that as you're anticipating the needs of your customer, as you're mapping out your e-commerce marketing funnel uh, and the portions of the buyer's journey that are gonna take more time. Which portion in your experience have you found takes more time to cultivate? Which portions of the buyer journey have you seen need more attention or could be more challenging for you? Let me know in the chat. We'd love to have discussion around uh, the buyer journey in more detail. So now you understand the different models of e-commerce that are available, the different innovative delivery methods that you can that you can use or practice to make sure that you have e-commerce success. But now we need to talk about how you measure that success for the e-commerce space. We're always going to have to look at key performance indicators. For e-commerce, they are a little bit different than the traditional uh, business KPIs, the ways to track them, and also the ways to properly benchmark and measure them. So the KPIs in the e-commerce space are used to monitor three different categories, sales, marketing, and customer support. You need to make sure that your KPIs are set on those target areas and based on your business objectives. So the major categories for e-commerce are sales, marketing, and customer service. Sales is the more quantitative, marketing is more qualitative, and customer service is a mix of both. There are many sales KPIs for the purpose of the digital space and for e-businesses. These are the four that need to be focused on if you're beginning in your e-commerce journey or if you don't necessarily have experience with tracking your KPIs in the e-commerce space. The average order value lets you know how much your customers typically spend on one single item. That's your total revenue over the number of orders. This is important if you're looking or considering drop shipping. If you're not moving items in bulk, there may not be a need for a third party wholesaler. It's also really important to direct to customer delivery methods too. If you're finding that there's an uptick in product, Maybe you do need to move from direct customer to drop shipping. Maybe you do need somebody to handle the inventory for you. The second is the conversion rate. This identifies at what rate people are purchasing your products. If your conversion rate is low, you need to optimize your website. This sales KPI is critical to the subscription service e-commerce model. This is what will dictate to you how often people are coming to your site, subscribing, and purchasing. And this conversion rate is the total number of visitors to your website divided by the total number of conversions. You can also find your conversion rate if you have a Google business profile set up. Another tool that we discussed in the initial digital marketing session, this can be found in your Google Analytics as long as you have the proper tags set up for your website to track the conversion rate. Next is your consumer acquisition cost. This is the KPI that allows you to dictate your spending on a new customer. So this is sales, but all promotion and marketing. You can measure it by analyzing your marketing spend and how it breaks down per customer. The lower your acquisition cost, the better. Again, the biggest thing if you're doing subscription-based is retention over new customers. For drop shipping, it may be better to keep acquiring new customers. And for direct to consumer, it may be better to have just a niche market audience that's buying quality product. But you can dictate the spend of your marketing dollars and what, you, what it really costs you to keep that customer on based on your CAC. And then lastly is your repeat purchase rate. Again, this is very key in subscription based e-commerce as well, because it measures your customer's loyalty. That's that retention piece of the buyer's journey right there. And it can also help you plan your sales strategy. A higher repeat purchase 
is generally better. So while you want a lower customer acquisition cost, you want your repeat purchase rate to be higher. And depending on those numbers, it may be the difference between you doing a subscription site and a drops shipping service. Marketing KPIs are, again, the more qualitative data set for you to benchmark. The reason being is because marketing in the e-commerce space is digital, which means that each platform that you use to market will more than likely have its own analytics and reporting systems and algorithms. The beauty of that is it takes out the guesswork. There's no need for formulas. If you do a Facebook business account and you do a paid ad, you get instant insights as soon as your ad stops running. It'll give you everything from your ROI to your cost per click if you're doing a Google ad, if you're doing engagement and your engagement rate is important to your bottom line then it will antiquate all of that data for you. And usually it's given in a snapshot. It's not too lengthy to read. It's usually in graphic form and bulleted and it's clear and concise for you. So if you're looking for those more quantitative numbers, it's easy to access per marketing platform that you use. So for the qualitative purposes, here's what you should be looking at anytime you're doing marketing in the digital space. Your website traffic, for sure. It's the base of e-commerce as we discussed in the definition, we're talking about selling online. Your website traffic will tell you a lot about the way people navigate your site and the kind of experiences that they're having with it. So the total number of people who visit is the, is the bare minimum of what you should be tracking in terms of marketing KPI. Next is the social media engagement. This calculates how actively your fans or followers are interacting with your brand on social media. You can measure it on your own by the number of likes, comments, and followers. But specifically, if you log in under the business suite, it'll show you how your post is performing as soon as you log into your page. So again, it's, it's right there in front of you. You just need to be knowing to look for it and what exactly it means for business. And last is the customer retention rate. This is the only one that has a formula because it's based on period. So you would need to pull from your digital marketing data for the specific period of time to calculate your rates. And then last is the customer service KPIs. Again, these KPIs address that very clear disadvantage that we've talked about and has streamlined through this session, which is the lack of customer support in the digital space or the feeling of the lack of customer support in the digital space and also being able to have those touch points with your consumer base in the areas that you may not necessarily have full autonomy. So if you're doing a drop ship, these KPIs are gonna be really important to you because while the, the service provider may be a third party, when it gets delivered to your consumer, they're associating it directly with your brand. So customer service email count refers to the number of emails your customer support team or however you have it set up for people to communicate if they have grievance with your business or product receives from your customers. You should always be looking at that number and based on your other KPIs will dictate what that number should be in terms of benchmarking success. And then consumer satisfaction or your c stat score is the measure of your, your customer responses to surveys. This is super important when we're talking about utilizing email for retention, utilizing the customer information, utilizing your own data, which is the benefit for the direct-to-customer model. You have all of their information in one place. You can send them a follow-up survey about their experience purchasing. You can send it after the transaction. It doesn't necessarily have to wait until a problem arises. You can be proactive about receiving that information. And this is traditionally calculated for you. If you use a survey platform like SurveyMonkey or MailChimp, that information is given directly to you in the data set per survey. And then last is the average complaint resolution time. This is the amount of time it takes for the customer to resolve the consumer issue, starting from the point where you were first contacted 
by the consumer with the product. So the complaint resolution time should always be the number of customer service requests minus the total number of unsolved requests divided by the request received. This is really important, again, for those who are utilizing drop shipping and also for those who are utilizing direct to consumer base. If you're not actively able to handle customer complaints, then there may need to be a shift in your e-commerce model, or you may need to scale back in other areas. So these are really important indicators of how your customers are experiencing your product and service. So you have all of these different KPIs. How are you actually utilizing them to measure success? This is where the benchmarking comes in. So there are six ways or steps that you need to be taking when you're trying to benchmark your e-commerce KPIs. The first is to identify your long-term business goals. So are these KPIs, again, it's a journey, are these KPIs more short-term or long-term? How do you need to adjust to fit into your business goal? You then need to identify the current performance of your website. We talked about how important it is to look at your web analytics in our previous session, but also we talked a lot about web analytics in this as well. You need to determine which areas you must focus on to measure. So of the three core categories of KPI, the sales category, the marketing category, and customer service, maybe you're not at a place where you can successfully track all three. Find one to focus on and really hone in on what you can do to benchmark your success under that category. As we talked about sales, marketing, and customer service uh, buckets for your e-commerce KPIs, we also discussed which of those would be best depending on whether you're doing drop service, whether you're doing direct to consumer or whether you're doing site subscription. So you can tailor your area of focus accordingly. The next thing to do is identify the right KPIs within those categories to track success. So in the sales funnel, it was a lot of formula information, right? It was four to five formula-based KPIs that don't even cover the full scope of what's included in that category. I felt like they pertain best to business to business and to small businesses that may not have the manpower to dedicate to a full breadth of, of sales KPIs. But even in that, maybe you only wanna focus on your AOV as opposed to trying to focus on all four metrics. That's something that you can identify to make sure that the benchmarks match where your business is at. The next thing you can do is set up the benchmarking itinerary. This is the frequency of when you'll be checking these KPIs. And the last thing is to perform, measure, tweak, and repeat. Journey. Do not be afraid to look at your analytics and retool and reassess. It's something that's going to happen throughout your small business life cycle anyway. It's something we've all had to experience in the midst of a pandemic. Pandemic is to have to go and recess, retool, make some changes, and then repeat. And I know that you all are growing more accustomed to it, which is why many businesses are able to come into the e-commerce space. You have to be flexible, you have to be innovative, and you have to look at the data not in a way of being discouraged by it, but in a way of letting you know what can be done differently, what worked well, and what can be done better. So to close, I just want you all to take away a couple of things from today's uh, session. The most important being that almost anything can be purchased through e-commerce today, which means that no matter what kind of product or service you have, there's an innovative way to engage in this market. The next thing is that it can be a substitute for brick and mortar stores. Everything right now in the economy is super inflated. And so if there's a way that you can transfer your business digitally, or maybe you want to try a hand at increasing your revenue and maintain both, it is doable as long as you're innovative and in understanding your buyer journey and propositioning the right product or service. 
for the space. KPIs will vary based on your business and the need of your buyer. It's a malleable thing. It's very fluid. You have to be fluid as well. Understand that your audience is key in determining the buyer's journey. You cannot dictate or try to predict what your consumer wants. The beauty of the digital space is that it's a connector. We're connected with people worldwide. We're connected with people in different arenas that we didn't even know desired our product or service. And the space is helping us to retool our products and services to meet multiple needs. So instead of trying to predict, go through the steps of the journey to understand exactly what it is that the buyer is looking for and what you can do with your product or service to set you apart from your competitors. And the last thing again is to be fluid with your strategy and be patient. There are different ways for you to reach your audience. I think the Burling Package Company is a great example of that. If you're looking to be contracted but you're unable to get contract, maybe you can be on the supply chain side of that, of that transaction. Maybe it's not going to the corporate suite and saying, hi, hire my company's janitorial service. Maybe it's going to the janitor, the janitorial service that's already in there and saying, I have a better deal on wholesale gallon jugs for cleaning products. I have a better deal on whatever product or service that you're currently using. And here's how I can help you reach your goal. And I thank you all very, very much for your time. Are there any uh, questions you have? Um, Alexis, thanks for your presentation. We have uh, actually one comment, <clears throat> one question in the comments session. We have uh, Ms. Sonja King, which mm -hmm. she's not sure if her handmade jewelry business will meet the guidelines of subscription. Okay. Well, that's um, so for subscription, if that's something you're interested in, one of the ways that you can anticipate if it would work for handmade jewelry is to send a survey to your repeat customers only. And again, you have to be very specific about your KPIs when you're looking at that. So how much did this customer buy? Did they buy on a monthly basis? How consistent were those purchases? That will dictate the demand for a subscription. If you have five or six customers that are buying four pieces every couple of months or maybe buying pieces in bulk or multiple pieces around the holiday, there may be a subscription option available for them where they, you know, they know that they're going to get a box of your exclusive jewelry, or maybe you can allow them to pick two or three custom pieces a month and give them a bulk price versus them having to itemize the buy. So as we discussed uh, in, in the presentation, for subscription, it's about either replenishment, access, or convenience. So if you're making handmade products, is it a product that needs to be fulfilled often? Is it that your consumer wants more access to exclusive jewelry, things that no one else is going to have? Or is it a convenience? I don't want to go to Zales. I don't want to go to Macy's. I don't want to order online and track through USPS. I want to work directly with you because I love your product, right? So those are the those are the things that you need to consider when you're trying to see if your business is ready for subscription. You're looking at whether your consumer will need to replenish and how often they'll need to do so. What kind of access are you giving them that they cannot get elsewhere? And also how convenient is your product? So I hope that helps. Thank you, Alexis. We also have a question from Eva Rivas. Uh, she would like to know if there is any system or online platform that allows her to determine the duties and taxes for international shipments. There is, yes, and I will provide those links. I do not have them on hand. I'm so sorry. That is a great question. Yes, especially if you're utilizing direct to consumer, which I'm assuming is, is what she's interested in doing is incurring those costs on her own. 
not only do you need to know what those costs are, but remember, we talked about in that purchasing phase, frictionless checkout. So you want your clientele to know about those prices up front. And one clever way to do that is to use it as an infographic on your social media. It's information that you as the business owner need. It's information that you know your customers are gonna need up front. And that way there's no surprise at the end of the transaction. So I will definitely um, source those and add them to have them be added to the comment section on YouTube as well. I need to find the exact links for those. But generally off the top of my head, I know that USPS on their website, they offer um, that information and it's up to date based on today's scheduling and pricing. And also any courier service should have that information on their website. Otherwise, there's a market for you there. If you're a courier and you, you see that your competitor doesn't tell you up front what these, uh, what these shipping costs are and even the duration of shipping, because that's changed as we know, that's an opportunity for you to go and steal some customers from them. Very good. Thank you, Alexis. Um, I think that we have room if there are any other questions for one more or two more questions before we close. Yes, please. Please, if I am here. Ask the way. If something comes up the way. All right. I don't see anything on the Q&A nor the chat. So I would like to thank you, Alexis, for, as usual, an amazing presentation. Certainly, I learned a lot, and I know everyone connected did as well. Please, everyone, <clears throat> make sure to check out the chat uh, feature as we have placed the information on how to access um, more information about Startup FIU Local, about the Miami-Dade Business Navigator, and how to access the presentation moving forward. We would like to thank you for connecting with us, and this is the second presentation out of a three uh, presentation series. The next one will be taking place on August 3rd, so we look forward to connecting with you then. And I hope you all have a great rest of the week and afternoon. And once again, thank you, Alexis. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Please make sure you follow us. We're Startup FIU Local on all social media. If there are topics that you want to cover, if you have questions for me or any of the Startup FIU Local team, that's the best way to reach us as well. Thank you. Thank you. You have a great rest of the day. Thank you. You all have a great day as well. Thanks.